Oh, hey. Hi, YouTube. How's it going? I didn't see you there. Hello. Hi. Hey. Hi there. Um, let's talk. Let's really talk. The world is terrifying. Uh, it's just one of those years, you know, again. But you don't really want to wake up and everything's fucked and everybody sucks. But, you know, I, I know that, you know, we all know because this collective waking nightmare has been the past two years of our lives. But amidst all the chaos and all of the chip shortages and all the game delays and all the bitcoins and all the NFTs, I actually really genuinely enjoyed some video games this year, which I know comes as a big shock because it, it's me. I don't like things. Blah, I get it. But like, no, I actually genuinely really like some video games this year. So we're going to talk about them. We're going to talk about my games of the year. You can see it over there. My games of the year for 2021, because listen, this is a YouTube video and this is what people do. They make games of the year videos. So that's what we're going to do right now. We're going to talk about my favorite games of the year. So fair warning, there's going to be spoilers for the following games and we're going to get into it and it's going to be fun. Hooray! let's do it. So remember when I said that I actually enjoy video games? Here's the thing. I kind of lied. S see, I have a reputation to uphold as a cynical bearded white dude who hates everything. So here's a handful of games that end up, unfortunately, kind of disappointing me. Retromania Wrestling. So I like wrestling. And when wrestling is good, it's it's art. So therefore, by extension, I like wrestling games. I mean, I even committed the absolute war crime of being kind of a WWE 2K20 apologist when it came out. And listen, I'm a weirdo who loves Fire Pro Wrestling World. But here's the problem. I'm over 2K20 and Fire Pro. And here's the thing. Retromania Wrestling, it promised to be something different. It promised to fill a niche gap in the already niche wrestling game space as a throwback to the 16-bit era of WWF, WrestleFest, and Superstars. But as more and more footage was shown of the game, something just kind of seemed off. Like the timing of the moves looked really, really awkward, the animations didn't look great, and it just, it didn't look fun. And the roster was this really weird smorgasbord of new independent wrestlers and old school wrestlers from the 80s and 90s, but they weren't the guys like Hogan and Savage and Flair. They were like these mid-carders that you kind of vaguely remember, some of whom revealed themselves later to be absolute dirtbags. And that's the thing, this game could have been rad. It didn't need to be the best game ever, it just needed to be pretty good. It just needed to be better than 30-year-old games weren't really all that great to begin with, but the problem was it wasn't. And that sucks because I just I just want a good wrestling game, you know, Mario Golf Super Rush. When the trailer for this game came out, I was all the fuck in. It looked great. And honestly, for the first weekend, the Mario Golf Super Rush came out. I had a lot of fun with it. Like the weird capture the flag battle golf mode thingamabobber with friends. That was fun as hell. And it was a solid game of arcade golf that controlled really well, had a solid roster, and with friends, it was dope. But the problem was, it was only fun for a couple of hours with friends. And unfortunately, it was the same for the career mode. It was fun for a few hours, but, you know, it was only fun for a few hours. The solid arcade golf could only take you so far when the career mode was kind of shallow. And that was the thing. That was a problem. It wasn't like Mario Golf Advance Tour with the dope ass RPG single player mode. There just wasn't really much to do in the single player. And soon enough, after a while, there wasn't really much to do in the multiplayer either. So I just kind of fell off this game. That sucks because it was a really solid foundation. Yeah, football 2022. Listen, we all already knew that this game would be bad. Konami is a shambling corpse. It's a shell of its former self, and it has been for years. And honestly, leading up to this game, after the initial teaser trailer a while back, that seemed to be just a downright lie, 
I think everybody knew this game would be bad. Thing was, we didn't think it would be this bad. We didn't think it would be the worst reviewed game ever on Steam levels of bad. Like, holy, oh my god, this game sucked. Listen, it sucked enough for me to make a mini review about how much the game sucked. Like, this might legitimately be the worst sports game that I have ever played. Because, oh my god, it's so bad. It's, it's so bad. It's so bad. Oh, it's so bad. It's so bad. Like, listen, it has like 10 teams in the game. It doesn't even have an offline mode or features or anything beyond exhibition games. And they took out controls and features from previous games. Like, the game legit looks like a late-era 360 or PS3 game on a PS5. The grass on the pitch looks like it's from PES 5. The crowds, the crowds, oh my god, they're, they're these terrifying monstrosities. I don't get it. Listen, before patches, it had the worst collision detection and physics I've maybe ever seen in any game ever. And then people shat all over it so hard that Konami had to delay updates and features over and over and over again, and nobody knows when we're going to get them. And you can just say, but Will, it was free. And yeah, it was. But they also put out a $50 version of this game. They tried to fleece people out of their money for digital fucking snake oil, my dudes. And listen, here's the other thing. It's Pez. This is one of my favorite game series of all time. They literally killed off the name Pez for this absolutely shambolic game. And they set everybody's expectations so low. So low with all of the pre-release talk of features being removed and how that this was going to be a base for the game going forward and everything else. But still, somehow, somehow they released a game so catastrophically bad that it still fell below people's expectations. Like, it was absurd. It was unbelievable how bad this game was. You couldn't fathom that the game could be this bad. And then you played it, and it was... Metroid Dread. Yeah, I know, it's blasphemy, right? But honestly, I haven't been this mad at spending $90 on a game in quite a while. Like, I don't... I don't think Metroid Dread is a good game. Or, or maybe I do. I don't know. I don't... No, my opinion on this game just varies wildly from day to day. There has been no game this year that has frustrated me as much and as frequently as Metroid Dread has. But there's some good things about it, right? Compliment sandwich. So let's talk about what Metroid Dread actually gets right. Honestly, the sense of movement in this game, it's fantastic especially as you're frequently required to run rather than fight whenever you're taking on the Nyon indestructible killer robots known as the ME. As far as flow of movement goes, this game probably has the best out of any this year. There's a few niggles here and there, I'll fully admit, like when I try to jump for ledges, it never quite feels right, and that can kind of lead to some shenanigans. And by shenanigans, I mean really frustrating deaths. But like 90% of the time, it feels absolutely incredible to just run and move in this game. Samus is just so effortlessly nimble and fast and the game moves fantastically well. And you know, credit for once to the Switch. For the most part, the frame rate keeps up with the demanding pace of the game's movement. Albeit at the expense of the game looking... Which segues into a negative. I know that it's a Switch, but honestly, Samus deserves better. And this is a first-party Nintendo game. I expect a lot more out of them. The game is just kind of a blurry mess. In spots, it, it actively looks bad. Honestly, both docked and undocked. I've heard really good things about how the game looks on the Switch OLED, but the thing is, I'm not going to spend $300 on a new console for a game that I don't even really like, maybe, kind of. I'm not sure yet. 
It's not just the flat, washed out, and blurry textures either, it's the game's world design. There's nothing particularly exciting to me or engaging about the game's world, and all of the austere grey corridors, they just, they just kind of run together at some point. Especially considering that, you know, this is a Metroid game. It's a series that wears backtracking proudly on its sleeve, and it has since its inception. It is THE backtracking game. But the problem is, backtracking in this game, it's often an exercise in frustration. Because as I said, everything just kind of runs together. So compound that with the fact that you just kind of shoot stuff if you're stuck until you progress, that whole shtick. In which again, everything just kind of looks the same, to the point that your eyes glaze over. It doesn't really feel great. But okay, another positive. From what I have played, and what I've read about the game, the story seems interesting. I can't say whether it's good or not, because like, to be completely honest, I've never been the biggest Samus R. Stan. <laughs> well, you know, at least they do something interesting with a story, and that's that's commendable. What isn't commendable, though, eh, the shooting controls. Honestly, almost in direct contrast to the movement controls, the shooting controls just kind of feel finicky and awkward a lot of the time. You can free aim with the right stick, but even after a good seven or eight hours spent with the game, it never quite felt right to me. But okay, another positive, right? The atmosphere of the game is helped in large part due to the music. Which is understated, but it's solid. The game has dread right in the subtitle. And yeah, even if there's a whole lot of grey corridors, the game feels appropriately oppressive. But here's my biggest problem with the game. The MEs are downright awful. These killer robots who can take you down in one hit and you cannot kill until you find a special weapon are supposed to instill the sense of dread in you, right? And yeah, the first handful of times that you see them and you have to bolt instead of fight? That is genuinely tense. And the game sings because Samus has so many tools at her disposal to be able to move so quickly that for the most part, you can't escape and it feels great. But the problem is at some point, you're not only seeing them all the time, thus taking away their effectiveness and the sense of tension and dread that you first felt, the corridors, like I said, don't feel quite as tightly designed as you'd hope to allow you to utilize your full movement arsenal to escape the ME. And remember how I mentioned that sometimes the controls can feel a little bit finicky? Well, that most definitely rears its head the most when you're running from the ME. And after only an hour or two, encounters with the ME stop feeling so dreadful, so tense, and they quickly just become an exercise in frustration. They're an interruption to the free-flowing movement and shooting of the game. And it's not even particularly rewarding to kill them. You're just pissed off because you know in the next section that you'll have to face off against one who's twice as annoying and appears twice as frequently. It just it feels like the developers played Alien Isolation and tried to translate that game's masterful sense of dread and tension to Metroid. And you know, rightfully so. It was an interesting approach to bring some horror elements to Metroid. I remember when I first discovered the series back with Super Metroid, and yeah, my mind raced with the idea of this strange, austere, bleak alien setting. It was amazing. And Alien Isolation worked because most of the time, the Xenomorph was pants-shittingly terrifying. In its design, in its movement, and even the fact that when you needed to hide most of the time, you could. In the sense that you had your tools at your disposal to run and distract it, and that shit worked. In the sense that you could run around the Xenomorph. And most importantly, when Alien Isolation really worked before it got kind of bloated and samey, it had impeccable pacing. Depending on how long it took you in the opening section of the game, you could go anywhere from like 45 minutes to 2 hours without actually seeing the alien. The game builds tension through vents rattling around and the iconic beep of your sensor, and it's amazing. Now, I'm not saying that Metroid Dread needed to just steal everything from Alien Isolation whole cloth. But Alien Isolation knew how effective the Xenomorph was as a means of sheer terror and tension. And when it got things right, it nailed the pacing. It knew when to slowly drip-feed you tension and when to bludgeon you over the head with it. 
the thing was with Metroid Dread, it's all just kind of bludgeoning. And at some point it starts to suck. But I think this game is good. I think I don't know. I feel like I have to like it because I'm being told that I have to like it. I don't think I do like it. At the end of the day, I yelled out, this game sucks multiple times while I was playing Metroid Dread. If that isn't indicative that, you know, maybe a game does suck, I don't know what is. The thing is, when this game gets it right, it is incredible. It is one of the best games of the year. But for me, unfortunately, it gets it wrong so much more often than it gets it right. Returnal. So, spoiler warning. Returnal is going to be one of my top 15 games of the year. But that doesn't mean it can't still be one of the most disappointing games of the year. And I'll get to why when I talk about it a little bit later. XO1. You take control of this like marble disc thing and you're flying around planets. And the reason why I love this game so much is just the effortless joy of movement. This game nails momentum and movement and flight like nothing else I've seen in a very long time. Resting over the clouds to then plummet back down towards the ground at a breakneck speed and then pull up at the last second and do it all over again, all whilst some dope noise rock swells in the background, it feels incredible. I mean, honestly, this game is cool as hell. I want to check out some more of it. Forza Horizon 5. Listen, we all know what Forza Horizon 5 is. It's racy, racy, zoomy, zoomy with a bajillion dollar cars and old junkers that you turn into thousand horsepower monsters for the lulls, and it looks really, really pretty. Unfortunately, though, I don't have a Series X, and my computer would melt simply from me looking at screenshots of Forza Horizon 5, let alone thinking of even installing it. So unfortunately, right now, I haven't played it because I don't have a Series X and I'm not going to get one until 2027 like everybody else. So can't put it on my top 15. Sable. I've heard rad things about this chill, striking exploration game and it's on Game Pass and I've installed it and I'm going to play it. I swear to Christ, I will play this game. Chicory, a colorful tale. So I just bought this neat painting adventure game thing like two days before I started recording for this video and I've heard really, really good things and I'm jazzed as hell to play it and it looks adorable and inventive and cute and neat, but I haven't played it and I want to. I'm going to play it, I swear. I swear I'm going to play it. Metroid Dread. Okay. So go back a few minutes to figure out why I can't realistically name this game as one of my favorite games of the year. Half the time, it definitely is. And when it gets things right, it gets them so right. Unfortunately for me, when it gets them wrong, it gets them so wrong. And I can't in good conscience put a game that frustrated me as much as Metroid Dread did on my game of the year list. Far Cry 6 and Riders Republic. So I'm going to lump these games together because they're both Ubisoft er games. Except, you know, one has this awesome crocodile named Guapo and you shoot stuff. 
while the other game is all about people never shutting the fuck up about how cool extreme sports are. They're quintessential Ubisoft games. Games in which icons are vomited onto maps and you run down a list of stuff to do. In the case of one game, or maybe both, I haven't played enough Riders Republic to know if you get a gun or not. You shoot an arbitrary amount of people to check off a list. And in the other game, you do enough arbitrary, very cool extreme sports stuff to check off a list. These games are both good. They're solid. They're seven, seven and a half out of ten games. But they're nothing more. And I'm glad I didn't spend full price on either of them. And the thing is, Ubisoft is a trash company run by trash people, not only too scared to actually say anything of note or interest, with its totally not political games, like Far Cry. But it's also devoid of any real original or interesting ideas. And it has been for a long time. These games are both totally good and fine. And I enjoy my time with them because it's 2021, and honestly, more often than not lately, I just need to consume the video game equivalent of McDonald's. And that's what these games are. Football Manager 2022 In any other year, Football Manager would probably be my number one game of the year, if not at least in the top three. At the end of the day, I'm a sports boy as much as I'm a soft boy. I'm especially a sports sim boy. Your Eastside Hockey Managers, your Extreme Warfare Revenges, your Football Managers. The more abstracted that you can make a sport, and the more text and thinly veiled Excel spreadsheets that you can throw at me to represent physical exertion, I'm all in. I love it. And I've loved Football Manager for a long, long time now. For Football Manager, legitimately, every new iteration of this game is probably the best version of it. Because the foundation is so rock solid that the devs at Sports Interactive, they just need to tweak little things. Until they don't. Until they make big sweeping changes. Like this year. With an overhaul of how dribbling animations play out in their 3D match engine. And yeah, that sounds like an improvement to the game that doesn't actually really do much. It kind of just sounds like, you know, marketing speak. But the thing is, this is legit game changing. It makes the entire game look and feel so much more authentic. And you appreciate now the skills of players and their ability to actually control the ball. It makes signing skilled players that much more rewarding to actually see them pull off skill moves. And the other thing too is they've adapted to the modern approach to football. They've added wide center backs to give you more attacking options from the back. They've added a data center so that you can precisely see what you're doing well and what you can improve on, which is honestly fantastic because in the past, figuring out exactly what you were doing wrong and how to fix it, it was a huge exercise in frustration. They've also overhauled the transfer deadline day to more accurately reflect the absurd capitalist bedlam in the game. And honestly, it's fun and it's engaging and it's tense and it really just adds some spiciness to a game in which 90% of the time you're just looking at menus. So you're thinking, wait, why isn't this a top 15 game then? Honestly, it simply comes down to the fact that I haven't really played enough of this game to feel comfortable about giving it a top 15 spot. And it's also, it's a little bit glitchy. There's a, there's some stuff they need to work out. But when they will, and when they do, and when I play more of it, I'm going to love it. Because it's Football Manager, and I love it. Because I'm weird. Knockout City. So I remember when the trailer for Knockout City came out during, I think, like a Nintendo showcase. And I thought, honestly, it looked like absolute trash. Well, I'm happy to say that I was so, so, so wrong. The sense of movement is great, even if I panic and I dash my way into Doom way too often, and the map designs are solid, and the simple act of clobbering somebody in the face with a dodgeball is just as rewarding as I imagine it would be in real life. I've never done it. Nerd! 
Knockout City is colorful and vibrant and not gross with microtransactions, and I'm not getting yelled at for my sexual preferences or my melatonin levels. And honestly, for that, I love it. I don't love it enough for it to make the top 15, because yeah, honestly, I'm pretty trash at this game. But it's seriously fun as hell. Animal Crossing New Horizons I apparently played like 300 hours of this game last year. I only played nine of it this year. And why? Because Nintendo did absolutely nothing to incentivize players to come back to the game. And even in a game in which, essentially, you have to make your own fun at all times, after the first few weeks, it was really, really hard to make your own fun. But then they finally put out the 2.0 update, and it was rad as hell, and it added a whole lot of fantastic content to the game. A lot of which, arguably, should have been in there in the first place, or at the very least, it should have been in the game months ago. But the thing is... This technically isn't a 2021 game, and yes, I could be all pedantic about it and still put it in my top 15, but even with all the rad new content, I still got pretty bored pretty quickly, and I put it down again. But the thing is, I'm really excited for the 3.0 update. Oh. Dice Legacy. So, full disclosure, I was given a code to Dice Legacy via the game's publisher. But the thing is, I really, really like this unique, interesting take on a city building game that used dice rolls to determine virtually everything about how you played the game. Do you need resources? Well, you better hope that you roll the resource gathering dice. And same with the building dice and the dice for getting more citizens and so on and so on. It was a really cool, unique twist on a genre that I fully admit I'm not super into. My only critique of the game is that it had a bit of a steep learning curve, and in my time playing it, I could never really figure out the optimal way to play it and actually, you know, do well. But also, I'm horrible at city builders. But seriously, check out Dice Legacy. I think a lot of people slept on it, which is really too bad, because it's a really unique, cool twist on a familiar genre. Number 15, Turnip Boy Commits Tax Evasion I say this with the utmost respect and love. Turnip Boy Commits Tax Evasion is a stupid game. And honestly, for that, I absolutely adore it. Turnip Boy is a game that so easily could have just been regurgitated, tired memes that weren't funny to begin with, that were made that much less funny by being old as balls by the time that the game came out. But luckily that isn't the case. It's simple. In this game, you're a turnip who's also a boy and you don't take shit from anybody. The game consists of admittedly kind of simple combat and admittedly kind of simple side quests until it's absolutely bizarre, ridiculous climax. And on paper, it doesn't really sound like it's anything that's too amazing. A turnip boy is very much one of those games that's more than the sum of its parts. And it's a game that, in a way, kind of defies description. It's a game that's best experienced and seen for what it is. A wonderfully bizarre, whimsical, silly, and genuinely hilarious way to spend a few hours. Turnip Boy oozes, quite literally sometimes, charm. And that's what it has going for it more than anything else. Undeniably, ridiculously cute charm. It is genuinely so, so, so hard for games to do comedy well. More so than any other medium. I'd argue because comedy relies upon, and often players can get in the way of good, you know. But Turnip Boy doesn't have that problem. Turnip Boy is genuinely hilarious, and I love it, and I love him, and he is perfect. And he is innocent, and even if he is guilty, I don't give a shit, because he is wonderful. Eventually. Good timing. Number 14, New Pokemon Snap. Listen, any game where I can take pictures of Trubbish, unequivocally the best Pokemon, is an instant 10 out of 10 goat. But I guess I have to talk more about one of my games of the year, right? The thing is, honestly, there isn't much to say. It is very much exactly as advertised. New Pokemon Snap. 
It doesn't do anything particularly inventive, which I know is shocking from a Pokemon game, but it doesn't need to. The OG Pokemon Snap was a fun and novel, albeit tragically short game. The new one is basically the same premise, but the Pokemon look great and the evaluations of pictures, it doesn't feel so goddamn arbitrary, and there's just enough new features and much needed depth added with a 4 star system to capture multiple pictures and poses of the same Pokemon, along with alternative routes and day and night versions of the maps to make new Pokemon Snap a much better version of a beloved classic. Seriously, that's honestly all there is to say about it. It's Pokemon Snap, but it's new, and it's adorable, and it's exactly what I expected and wanted it to be. And that's totally cool. Number 13, The Dark Side of the Moon. The cheek, the nerve, the gall, the audacity, and the gumption of this absolutely batshit insane FMV game created by one dude from Yorkshire in the UK. And this game was also written by and stars said dude? And his kids and his wife, I think? And man, you can tell he is from Yorkshire. This game is just charming as all get out, to be completely honest. This game is just charming as all get out, essentially. The story is absolutely pants on head ridiculous. And yeah, sometimes they probably could have done another take for line deliveries. And it's corny as hell and it's stupid and it's ridiculous. But the thing is, it knows it. Everyone is in on the fact that this game is absolutely bonkers. And that can sometimes be a bit much. But it isn't in this game. Anna Rosa Butler, who plays the main character Dean's friend Alex, and Rupert Booth, who plays the main antagonist of the game, both of whom were in another recent FMV favorite of mine, Contradiction, Spot the Liar, bring just the right level of over-the-top cheese to this game, and I love it. Booth, in particular, is just such an absolutely perfect, unhinged, scene-chewing, bonkers-ass villain, and I love him so, so, so much. I was cackling with laughter at some of his line delivery. Also, I fully acknowledge that, yeah, I might be a bit biased because I played this game from hours roughly 12 to 16 of a 24 hour stream with a bunch of amazing people in my community that came along for the ridiculous ride. But the thing is, like I said, this so could have easily gone off the rails. This game is in on the joke. It knows it's ridiculous. And that can be so cloying or it can just fall flat, but it doesn't. Dark Side of the Moon kicks down the door, grabs your hand and says with the utmost confidence, strap the fuck in, my dude. We are going for a wild ride. Number 12, Hitman 3. Hitman 3 is probably the best Hitman has ever been. Like, there's no dude to boot it. <laughs> New dude to boot it. It is Swedish-made stealth perfection. But I don't think I really love Hitman 3. Or at least not as much as I loved Hitman 1. Why I loved Hitman 1 so much was because it shouldn't have worked. Honestly, I dabbled in Hitman before 2016 in the way I dabbled in college. Not enough. But in 2016, I didn't just dabble in Hitman, I went all the fuck in, dude. For months upon months, I was obsessed with Hitman 1, due in large part because of how they drip-fed content via an episodic release model. So you're expecting me to now hold that against Hitman 3, right? The fact that it's not episodic. I mean, I could, and to a degree, I, I do. I remember back in the lead-up to Hitman 1, hearing that they were going to release maps in an episodic format, a la The Walking Dead, and it was in the nascent days of games as a service, and it felt kind of icky, and it still kind of feels icky sometimes, but honestly, IO Interactive got it right in the first game with their trilogy. They released maps at a steady enough clip that you got your fill, and then you put the game down and you moved on, but then like a month later, a new map or an elusive target came out, and you'd be like, oh, fuck yeah, dude, and you'd get ripped to shreds because, you know, you're bad at stealth games. So needless to say, I had a buttload of fun with Hitman 1. And when Hitman 2 just released everything all at once, I respected the hell out of it for making substantial improvements to an already great game, but it didn't really have as much staying power as Hitman 1, because there was no real sense of anticipation or incentive 
to really feel like I wanted to come back to the game. Despite the fact that, you know, 2 probably has the best collection of maps out of all of the games. So now Hitman 3. I really like it. I respect it. I think that Dartmoor, for example, is a really cool map that is self-contained and has a lot of intrigue and it's it's dope. And I think that Berlin is really cool in theory. I think it does something really interesting with the Hitman formula by taking away what makes you feel so cool and Hitman-y. Information. And Hitman 3 still has everything that makes these games so fucking rad. It has doofy ass kills and hilarious incidental dialogue from NPCs at the absolute perfect time. And it has 47's deadpan delivery of every single line of dialogue and his stupid self-satisfaction whenever he thinks of some dumbass one-liner mere seconds before he murders somebody in cold blood. It still has all that stuff and it's still great. And it looks incredible. Especially the Dubai map and the China map with all of its rain-slicked neon you know you love wet pavement in video games asshole glory. And it's also got VR, which is cuckoo bananas. But, and it's a big but, and I cannot lie, I think the biggest problem with this game is that it gives too much of a shit about Agent 47. Hitman 2 took Agent 47's story really seriously. Like, deadly seriously. And honestly, for the most part, it, it worked. Hitman 3, it like quadruples down on Hitman 2's narrative focus. And though honestly it's relatively well done and intriguing, I think it actively detracts from what makes Hitman fun. I feel like there's just a little bit too much focus on storyline and narrative and doing things in a very particular way rather than just stupid ass wacky murder hijinks. Listen, don't get me wrong, there is still plenty of stupid ass wacky murder hijinks. But I feel like with Hitman 1 and 2 I didn't have to search so hard to find them. And with Hitman 3, I feel like I'm actively getting led down a very narrow, dour murder corridor to see out a narrative that I don't really care that much about. Also, as much as I gave Dartmoor credit for being a super rad map, I think this game has the weakest maps on a whole out of any of the three IO Interactive games. And the last map is... it's just kind of bad. And listen, maybe I'm a big old dum-dum who can't just exert free will and return to games whenever I see fit rather than being told to return to games when updates come out, but my biggest problem with Hitman 3 wasn't just the focus on the narrative or the hit man and miss of the maps. Boo! It was the fact that once I finished it, unlike Hitman 2 and especially unlike Hitman 1, I never really felt any incentive to go back to it. I never really felt any incentive to keep bopping motherfuckers with expired spaghetti cans or yeeting axes into people's heads. I just kind of finished the game, I uninstalled it, and then that was it. I respect the fuck out of the game. I respect it a lot. It looks great, it plays great, because Hitman is still great. I liked it. I, I, I really liked it. But the problem is, I wanted to love it. And I don't think I did. So full disclosure, Capturing footage for Game of the Year, going back to this game, I liked it way more, but the problem is... I still don't love it like I love those first two, especially Hitman 1. It's still one of my top games of the year, and it's so, so close to, like, honestly, probably that top five. But to be honest, this probably should have been my Game of the Year, unfortunately. And it's not. But it's still really, really good. It's, it's really good. Oh my god, it's really good. It's a really good game. Number 11 Before Your Eyes Before Your Eyes is a game with a really, really, really inventive and great gimmick. Every single time that you blink, the game cuts. And it skips ahead to a new scene. That scene could be taking place five seconds after the last, or five minutes, or five years. And you have to turn on your webcam and genuinely blink, or try not to blink, to play the game. Without getting into all the details of the game's plot, it gets heavy. And I bawled my little soft boy eyes out at multiple points throughout the game. You can play this game in a sitting or two, and honestly, I think if you've got the setup to make it work reliably, everyone ought to experience this game. 
It is something wholly unique and interesting and relatable and beautiful and heart-wrenching. And it is anchored by solid voice acting and a great look and a really, really inventive and cool gimmick that genuinely works. Number 10, Resident Evil Village. The most unrealistic thing about Resident Evil Village is not the ginormous eight foot tall vampire lady of your wet dreams. It's the fact that Ethan can suffer so much catastrophic blood loss, maiming, and just general punishment and be totally cool. Resident Evil Village is more Resident Evil, or more specifically, it's more Resident Evil 7, but with a mammary mama on overload. That isn't necessarily a bad thing, though. I will say, the fact that Lady Dimitres was so heavily hyped up in the lead up to the game, only for her to be gone within like the first two hours, depending on how fast you get through the first section, it's pretty disappointing. Because of the four main baddies, she is not only definitely the most fully realized character and interesting character, but she's probably got the best gameplay as well. I didn't play much of Resident Evil 7, so I can't really speak to how Village improves upon it, but I can say that overall, I really enjoyed Village. The puzzles felt Resident Evil-y without being too complicated or frustrating, the gunplay felt solid, and overall, I just kind of had a really good time with it. Was it perfect? No, not even close. Honestly, for a PS5 game, it didn't look all that great. It wasn't overly scary, really, or particularly tense compared to, say, something like the Resident Evil 2 remake or what little I played of Resident Evil 7. It was also piss ass easy, especially after I essentially broke the game with the Wolfsbane and the rocket launcher, and it was like really short. And when I say short, I mean short. I clocked in at literally a minute over eight hours. And though I didn't need this to be a hundred hour epic, I just needed a little bit more of everything. A little bit more of a challenge, a little bit more of puzzle shenanigans, and a lot more of Lady Dimitres. But I digress. The thing is, I really enjoyed this game for what it was. It was a game that not only awakened in me and the internet as a whole a big lady slash gigantism fetish, but it was a solid, piss-ass easy game that I bought for 50% off where I could just laugh at how stupid the werewolves looked. Basically, it boils down to this. There's definitely better ways to spend eight hours. But there's also definitely worse ways to spend eight hours. Number nine, Returnal. Man, Returnal is... Returnal is a conundrum of a game. This could have and should have been, if not my game of the year, at least in the top three. And honestly, for the first like eight to ten hours of playing this game, it was. And for some people, it probably is their game of the year. But those people are fucking insane. This game is deeply, deeply flawed. And the more you play it, the more it reveals its flaws. It's death by a thousand cuts with this super intriguing, visually stunning, mind-bending, Geiger and Metroid-inspired 3D bullet hell shooter roguelike thing. Okay, so first off, what do I like about Returnal? Though I haven't finished the game because I'm bad at games, I think the narrative, from what I've seen and experienced of it, is really, really intriguing. I love that the game doesn't really explain itself too much and you get insight into the game's narrative via warped, fragmented, disjointed vignettes that come in random bursts. You could get a big old narrative dump in the span of like one or two runs, and then go another like 15 runs without seeing anything. And honestly, I really like that, because that's how memory actually works. Trauma is not neat, and memory is slippery and loose and fickle. And the game does a really great job of capturing that. Also, this game looks fantastic. The rain slicked muted color palette works really, really well, and it makes all of the bloomy particle effects and pops of color burst in amazing ways. Even if sometimes I can find it a little bit hard to judge depth and distance in the game when I'm trying to dash and jump around, which often leads to me kind of eating shit a lot. I think the game's understated and moody soundtrack of discordant strings gels really, really well with the gunplay, 
and honestly, it's dope as hell. The gameplay is generally really, really engaging and fun, especially in the first area, and the risk-reward of either playing it safe and getting to new areas, or pushing on into possibly dangerous situations for vital upgrades is really great, it's dope. I love the game's system of upgrading your abilities by simply not getting hit. You're only a few good shots away from improving your chances of survival in the game, and I love that. The game's sense of momentum and the speed at which you move is just and shoot things, it's fucking incredible! Honestly, this alongside Metroid and probably Deathloop and Monster Hunter Rise, it probably has the best movement of any game this year, and that's really helped by a rock-solid frame rate. Seriously, talking about this game and revisiting it again for this list, it gets me excited. When it works, this game works beautifully. So what don't I like about it then? Well, first and foremost, up until recently, the game didn't really have a way to save it mid-run. And that sucked. Because listen, I'm a grown-ass adult with shit to do. And if runs were, say, only 15 minutes or so, maybe even a half hour at the longest, it wouldn't be that big of a deal. But sometimes, really solid runs, they could last anywhere between 45 minutes to multiple hours. And if you had to go do something, you were screwed. Sometimes I'm all for games disrespecting and antagonizing players just to fuck with them. But the thing is, I'm not ever for games disrespecting players' time. And until recently, when Returnal implemented a mid-run save feature, honestly, it probably disrespected its players' time the most out of any game I can think of in recent memory. The other thing was this was all compounded by my other biggest problem with the game. It was wildly uneven in its difficulty spikes. When I eventually got used to how the game played, I could get through the first area relatively easily. The second area, not so much. The third area, I don't even know, I only saw it like four times. And for me, anything past the third area, it might as well be goddamn Narnia or a small town in Canada that's tolerant of minorities. Fictional. And again, I know that I'm bad at games. But this wasn't just me, a lot of people around the internet were saying the exact same thing, that the game just felt uneven, and more importantly, it just felt unfair. The other problem is it's hard to feel motivated to revisit the game now that it finally respects my time when I know later areas are overly punishing and hard. Another sticking point for me was how unique the game's areas felt. I don't really pretend to know all of the intricacies of procedural generation. I'm not a procedural generation scientist. I do know, though, that within a few hours of playing the game, the sheen of ooh, it's all procedurally generated, it just kind of wore off, and Returnal just kind of boiled down to the same handful of types of rooms that were pieced together to make up a run. Listen, I like this game a lot, and like I said, to this game's credit, in its early hours, it was probably a top three game of the year to me. But then, like me after one gin and tonic, the game just kind of showed its cracks. This joke doesn't really work. I don't have multiple ass cracks. This is a bad joke. What am I doing with my life? Anyway, Returnal, Returnal is a good game. It's a solid game. It's, it's a great game, even. But the thing is, it should have been incredible. The kind of mushy controls mixed with some really baffling design decisions with regards to difficulty spikes and the whole game structure, both in terms of level design and the lack of a mid-run save, it just kind of burned me out on the game, unfortunately. Not enough to drop it from contending for game of the year, but the thing is, this could have and should have been my number one game of the year, and unfortunately, it isn't. Number 8 Ratchet and Clank Rift Apart so, is the whole Rift thing essentially a means to show off the PS5's obscenely fast SSD that renders load times virtually non-existent? Absolutely, yes. And did the whole Rift thing kind of feel underwhelming because in trailers it looked super inventive and neat, whilst in practice it was just kind of a glorified teleport move between cover points aside from a handful of big set pieces? Absolutely, yes. And did playing Ratchet & Clank Rift Apart still make me look at every other video game released differently and silently judge them whenever load times last longer than two seconds? Absolutely. Yes. Oh my god, just load the store so I can sell my fucking turnips! 
So I went into Ratchet & Clank Rift Apart, admittedly probably wanting a little bit too much out of it. Despite the game dealing with alternate dimensions and time rifts and a girl Lombax who definitely should have been named Ratchet, goddammit, it felt really safe. But safe in terms of a Ratchet & Clank game isn't necessarily a bad thing, because the series has always been pretty fucking rad. This is one of the few games on the PS5 that utilizes the adaptive triggers well, with there being alternate properties for guns depending on how hard you push said triggers. And all of your favorite weapons return and they still feel great and it's fun to experiment and fuck around with them all. It's great! And man does this game look good, whether it's with all the fancy stuff turned on or in performance mode. The lighting is mind-blowingly good, the particle effects are some of the best I've ever seen, Ratchet and Rivet's fur in particular looks amazing, and the shine on Clank's chrome? Wow. I could keep going on and on, but the point is the game looks fantastic. And even more excitingly, it runs buttery smooth, both on performance mode and with all of your fancy ray tracing stuff turned on, with a bajillion explosions going on all at once. Honestly, this is easily one of the best looking games that I've ever played. Does it all kind of run together? Admittedly, yeah. I couldn't really tell you many standout moments from a game that came out in June of 2021, but how much of that is the fault of the game and how much of it is that simply the last two years, everything's just kind of run together. Ratchet & Clank Rift Apart isn't going to stay with me like other games on this list did, but it also didn't need to. Did I want it to? Absolutely, yeah. If it did, if it pushed the envelope a little bit more, it would have been higher up my list. But it also served its purpose at a time when I was looking at my PS5 thinking, man, I really need something to play. And it served that purpose really well, because it not only looked and ran amazingly, but it played really well too. It was fun. And at the end of the day, that's all I needed from a Ratchet & Clank. Number 7 Monster Hunter Rise Honestly, in a year where a lot of Switch games ran like absolute dog shit, Monster Hunter Rise running at a steady frame rate honestly goes a long way to make it probably the best Switch game that came out this year. But it's also a really, really good Monster Hunter game. Much like Resident Evil Village, I can't exactly qualify how it improves upon the formula in minute detail because I'm a filthy casual at best. But I can say that the game's sense of verticality thanks to the physics-defying and very good boy Balamutes and the zippy-doo grappling hook that makes you feel like Spider-Man with a murderous grudge against dinosaurs helps switch. No. No. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. No. 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 Hell no! Not the Monster Hunter formula. I played 96 hours total on my Switch this year which is very much a statement about not only just sitting at home all year and doing fuck all and Animal Crossing kind of getting pretty boring in 2021, but it also says a lot about the Switch as a platform in 2021. 45 of those 96 hours, nearly half, were spent playing Monster Hunter Rise. And I easily could have spent hundreds more. Monster Hunter has always been, to me, about feeling really good. Monster Hunter Rise probably has some of the best hand feel in all of video games. The weight of a big ol' hammer cracking the skull of some rare, probably endangered, prehistoric beaver bird thing that you should probably be studying rather than murdering and carving up for its hide. Ooh, it's good stuff. And now, in Monster Hunter Rise, the feeling of traversing vast distances in half a second because of your grappling hook and the palamute, again, you feel like goddamn Spider-Man with a murderous grudge against dinosaurs. The weapons still feel dope as hell, and most every single class feels good in that way that when you find your optimal build, you cannot imagine any other way to play the game. And the new emphasis on verticality also helps add a sense of dynamism and never-ending momentum to everything you do. I had a lot of fun hanging out with friends, just flailing about wildly like an idiot whilst they carried me to victory and we saw numbers go up and finally felt something for once in our sorry, sorry lives. Monster Hunter Rise was fucking great, and it still is, and I'm sure that whenever the expansion comes out and the PC version comes out, I'm going to be playing a buttload more of it, because it's rad as hell. Number 6 Unpacking Unpacking is a game about, well, unpacking. But it's so much more than that. It's a coming-of-age story told subtly and brilliantly 
So the ways things change and stay the same for a young woman from her childhood to her young adulthood. Your goal in unpacking is to unpack her life through its various stages, everything from mementos to toiletries to books. There are so many books. And what I love about this game is how it tells so much without actually saying anything outright. It's a very definition of environmental storytelling. And what's so great is you get to participate in that environmental storytelling. It's how you pick up on subtle things like her partner not leaving any fucking room for anything of hers when she moves in with him, and how she can't proudly display her college degree. It's how things can anchor you throughout the years in the ever-changing, swirling sea of bullshit that is life and growing up. What I love so much about this game is the loving details in all of its unlicensed paraphernalia and figuring out what it is that is so subtly referenced and then getting flooded with wonderful waves of nostalgia and then feeling old as balls when the very obvious GameCube homage is mistaken for a goddamn rice cooker by every single Gen Z on the internet. What I love so much about this game is that it brings up strange conversations like how you store your razor and how every femme identifying person I know rightly said that you store it in the shower within easy reach and how every male I knew had never considered that that was a very obvious thing to do. What I love so much about unpacking is the tactile and the tactical sense of organization. Google Docs kept autocorrecting tactile to tactical and honestly, the more I think about it, the more that fits as well. There's this very real and rewarding sense of planning and, weirdly enough, tactics and execution to this game. You're tetrising stuff into shelves and cupboards and you're trying so goddamn hard to meticulously line up books and games and DVDs by their color, and you're lining up your cutlery and your pots and your pans by size, and it all feels so goddamn great until you realize that you've misplaced shit or you still got like five boxes to go and you're just like, oh my god, I hate this. And you just wildly dump stuff all willy nilly and hope for the best, just like in real life. You can beat this game in a single sitting, or you could spend hours upon hours arranging and rearranging and arranging and rearranging every single house and bachelor apartment that you move into. And it feels absolutely perfect and stress inducing and you just want it all to be over like real life unpacking, and then you finish one house, and you feel so goddamn accomplished for doing it, and then you click, and you're skipping ahead to an even bigger moment in your life, and an even bigger apartment with even more shit, and you just sigh and you hate it, and you don't want to unpack again, but then you do it again anyway, and you love it, and this game's awesome. Number 5, The Artful Escape. What a joyous, wonderful couple of hours that I had with this absolutely psychedelic wank fest of a game. And honestly, I say that in the most glowing way possible. The Artful Escape is one third furiously mashing print screen to grab screenshots of all the batshit bananas, staggeringly cool and gorgeous shit going on simulator, one third quippy dialogue, and one third endless runner. In this game, you star as Francis, the nephew of folk legend and definitely not Bob Dylan, but also totally Bob Dylan stand-in, Johnson Vendetti. And Francis is just a dweeb who can't live up to Johnson Vendetti's legacy, and it's crushing him, and man, oh man, as a queer millennial with a lot of hang-ups about identity and legacy and failed potential and all that stuff, yeah, I get it. And at first, I dug the hell out of the game's art style, but it wasn't exactly grabbing me. But then I let it wash over me like the music from all those 70s stoner rock bullshit bands that it takes so much inspiration from. And that's when it clicked. This game is a wonderful, beautiful love letter to being just a little bit different and weird and not quite being sure about anything and being scared about it at first, but then just saying, you know what, dude, fuck it. And maybe again, because I've been struggling a lot with my queerness and my identity and my selfhood and all that stuff over the last couple of years, but those themes really hit me. And legit, there wasn't much that hit me harder than when I got to customize my own Ziggy Stardust-esque rock god alter ego. It was incredible. And honestly, the game wouldn't have worked if it were just a big old psychedelic wank fest without any heart. What makes this game work so beautifully is the voice work of its main character, Francis, by actor Michael Johnson, as well as by Caroline Kinley, who voices Violetta. The voice cast in general is great. Lena Headey, for example, is this rad, all-powerful, omnipotent being. 
She's also great in this game as an all-powerful, omnipotent being. But Michael Johnson and Caroline Kinley really ground the game. And they make the very real and very human emotions felt by both of the characters believable against a backdrop of a galaxy-spanning acid trip. Honestly, this game is just a beautiful, fun, light, but sometimes very fucking real, dope game that you ought to check out. Number 4 Psychonauts 2 I have such a love-hate relationship with Double Fine games. Generally, to varying degrees of success, they have a history of being pretty good to amazing premises, but unfortunately, they're let down by kinda mediocre gameplay. And the original Psychonauts embody that the most out of any Double Fine game. The beloved cult classic had style and personality out the wazoo, but unfortunately, I just couldn't get into it because the gameplay wasn't... good. Psychonauts 2 is undoubtedly more Psychonauts, but luckily enough, it's also much better Psychonauts. I unfortunately haven't finished the game yet, but from what I have played, I will say with the utmost confidence that Psychonauts 2 is absurd as hell, inventive as hell, and like the OG Psychonauts, its lore and world is fascinating, cool, and fun. The art design in this game is amazing and it does so much to help not only fully realize the fascinating world of Psychonauts 2, but it does so much to bring heady, deep concepts to life and make them into generally really engaging and fun platforming sequences. And that's what makes this game work, is this game plays so much better than the OG Psychonauts. The platforming is, for the most part, really solid. It's fluid and fun, and the movement feels much better than the clunky original. One highlight in particular is a bowling level where you've got to do some pretty demanding platforming, and luckily enough, the controls don't get in your way, and it's a joy. That said, though, Psychonauts 2 doesn't have the pixel-perfect precision control of other platformers, and sometimes the game requires very precise and particular controls, and you don't quite have that level of control. And when I say that this game is undoubtedly more and better Psychonauts, sometimes that does mean that the kind of archaic and old game design sensibilities, they do rear their head. It's got kind of clunky checkpointing sometimes, it has an over-reliance on a lot of side quests that kind of bloat the game. The fantastic story and the inventive world design keep you going along, but sometimes it can be a little bit much to do some kind of fetch quest for somebody to get something for somebody else which then results in an elaborate, finicky platforming level that can lead to another fetch quest. And the boss battles, while being super cool in theory, unfortunately so far, they're not actually all that great in execution. They're fantastic premises that are kind of just let down by pretty rote and frustrating gameplay a lot of the time. Listen, you just heard me complain a whole bunch and poo-poo on this game, and you're like, okay, well then why is it number four, Will? Here's why. This game is amazing. This game is absolutely incredible. All of those complaints that I made, they're problems that seldom come up. And for the most part, I'm not only having a blast experiencing the fascinating world of Psychonauts 2 and loving the tale that it's telling and the very, very important and necessary discussion that it's fostering about mental health, but it's doing such interesting and cool stuff with level and world design and often the platforming is great too, but I want to keep playing it not only to see how the story plays out, but to see the next surreal platforming challenge that I have to contend with. And again, luckily enough, the platforming is solid enough that it's a blast to play. Which isn't something I could say about the first game. Psychonauts 2 is beautiful and sometimes dark and fucking hilarious and weird. It tackles very real problems and very real things. It deals with mental health and addiction and real ass shit, and it deals with these topics well. It brings up interesting points about saving people who suffer from mental health issues, about just being there and listening, and it explores how selfish it might be to try to save people, and how that can be fucking damaging. And it explores it in this amazing, incredible, inventive, fascinating way. And it explores it through platforming. That he's good. This game is nuanced and smart and mature and it is wonderful. This game takes huge, huge swings and for the most part, it absolutely hits it out of the park in so many ways. Unequivocally, 
Psychonauts 2 is Double Fine's best game they've ever put out. Number 3, Deathloop. Contrary to popular belief, I like fun. And Deathloop is just straight up fun. Unlike other games on this list that absolutely ripped my heart out and spat on it with a morbid sense of glee, Deathloop just went, hey my dude, do you like video game ass video games? And luckily enough for Deathloop, I responded with an enthusiastic, yeah, I like video game ass video games. The thing is though, Deathloop is not only a video game ass video game, it's a more shooty shooty, bangy bangy, stabby stabby focused iteration of Dishonored essentially. But it also has a really interesting world that you want to know more about. And it reveals all of its intricacies not only through the tried and tested audio logs, but incidental dialogue and organic gameplay moments. And honestly, Julia and Colt's interplay and their characterization to boot are goddamn great. Simply put, Deathloop is just an absolute blast, sometimes quite literally, to experience. Maybe in part I enjoy Deathloop because it makes a seemingly never-ending, repetitive cycle fun, unlike everything that I've experienced in the last two years of my goddamned life. I talked about the weapon feel in Monster Hunter Rise and how it nails that sensation of this is the best way to play this game, how could anybody else play it any other way? And Deathloop is very much in that mold. It very much subscribes to that philosophy of game design with its set of seriously these are just Dishonored's powers abilities that are called slabs. The game starts out fun enough and engaging with really solid, fast gameplay. But when it gets really good is when you've got a handful, or in my case, a metric ass load of runs under your belt and you're several upgrades deep on most of your slabs, your guns, and you've got a rad loadout of perks for not only your slabs, but your guns and Colt as well. And the thing is, these loadouts can wildly change how you approach the game, whether it be a fully upgraded ether ability that essentially makes you invisible all of the time, or it's Nexus that lets you link together enemies and kill an entire room full of dudes with just one headshot. I also love Deathloop's skibbity doo 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 boop ah soundtrack. It's frenetic and frantic and fun, just like the gameplay. I also love that this game is full of aha moments. From the first second that you figure out how to properly use a slab's power, the using slabs in tandem, and feeling like a badass, the studying and figuring out the routines of lowly grunts and visionaries, and how you can utilize them to your advantage and finally piecing together everything into one brilliant explosive Rube Goldberg machine of death and chaos that culminates in the perfect run? It's amazing. If I did have to level some criticisms at this game, and as a professional, I do. Okay. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, oh, okay. <laughs> They'd be as follows. One, for all of its intrigue and interesting world building, I just wish there were more of it in Deathloop. It's really, really cool to see how the world changes with its various times and how your actions and the actions of the visionaries affect the world. I just wish there were more of it. More visionaries, more world, more narrative. Also, the game looks great, and its whole kinda sorta 60s mod psychedelia weirdo motif is super cool, it's stylish as hell. But honestly, for a PS5 game, and maybe this is just more of a damnation of the PS5 or me being a hoity-toity boy, I think I kind of expected the game's graphics to be better. Also, also, there's definitely variation in how you can approach the game, but because your ultimate end goal is murking fools, unlike, say, Dishonored, the abilities and the perks that focus on dealing as much damage as possible, as quickly as possible, tend to be the ones that are best to use. I could also just be saying this as somebody who is god-awful at stealth games. And unlike Monster Hunter Rise, for example, I do think there are some abilities and upgrades in Deathloop that kind of feel useless. I'm looking at you, Havoc. But these are super minor quibbles with what I think is probably the most outright fun game that I've played this year. Deathloop is a cacophony of chaos. It revels in the absurd in every way imaginable, from its aesthetic to its characters to its gameplay. And the best thing about it is that it gives players the finely tuned tools to revel in the absurdity right alongside it. 
Number 2 Hot Wheels Unleashed Hot Wheels Unleashed has an incredible roster of iconic Hot Wheels cars and ridiculous dumb shit like a Tricera car and a hot dog car. It has a plethora of licensed stuff like the Ninja Turtles party van and Kit from Knight Rider and the DeLorean and Snoopy from Peanuts driving his doghouse. And then there's a dope Batman expansion. There's even recreations of real life cars like the Fiat 500 and a Mini Cooper and some fancy Koenigsegg worth like a billion dollars and an old ass Chevy truck. That's just to name a few. Needless to say, the roster in this game is staggeringly good. And the thing is, it would be so easy for the game just to be that. A really good roster of Hot Wheels cars. But then, it wouldn't be on this list if that were the case. The thing is, this game is so much more than that. It is genuinely great. First off, Hot Wheels Unleashed looks amazing. I say this without any sense of irony whatsoever. It might be the best looking racing game, maybe just the best game ever that I have ever seen, full stop. I know I said that about Ratchet and Clank, but like, I think this might look better. Okay, j okay, wait, just hear me out. Listen, don't close the video, okay? Please, just don't. This game looks amazing. This game is so good. This game is amazing. Oh, this game is so good. Listen, I have never seen a game so perfectly emulate the real world properties of materials. Plastic and rubber and chrome and sparkly paint and the cars in this game genuinely look like real ass toy cars. It is mesmerizing. The game uses bright, fun colors because, you know, it's a game about Hot Wheels and that ought to be bright and fun. And the absolutely mind blowing lighting model helps bring those colors and the incredible detail that they put into these cars and the tracks to life. What more I love about this game is that it gets so many little details so deliciously right. Like for example, cars pick up scuff marks and paint rubs off of them as you race along. And track details like stickers have little creases and little tiny air bubbles and fingerprints on them. Showing off imperfections and making this game feel so much more lived in. The tactile sense of authenticity and the love that has been put into these cars and these tracks, it's staggering. But again, this game could just be a really solid roster of cars that looks really good. But it plays well too. The sense of speed is rad as hell. That is something that arcade racers need to get right. And honestly, I think this game rivals the old school burnout games when it comes to absolutely nailing that breakneck, white knuckle sense of speed. The handling model is solid and demanding and there's a sense of balance and nuance in how you approach not only different cars and how they handle, but drifting and boosting. Solid drifting fuels your boosts and smart use of boosting throughout the winding gravity defying tracks can literally be the split second difference between success and failure, especially on the time trials. And the thing is, this game is genuinely challenging and engaging. The AI can and will roast your fucking ass if you're not careful, even just on the medium difficulty, let alone on any difficulty above that. But the AI also believably makes mistakes and every single race genuinely feels like an interesting, engaging challenge. Mind you, this game is not perfect by any means. For example, I wish there was a little bit more variation in the career mode because there's only straight up races and time trials punctuated by the occasional boss battle race that is slightly longer and it's way harder and it just has kind of weird gimmicks and obstacles. The game also has a livery editor a la Forza, but it's not even close to as in-depth or as intuitive and it hasn't taken off like I've wanted it to. Honestly, I think that's more so indicative of the game's community as a whole, really. The community and the multiplayer aspects of the game just kind of don't exist. The game also features blind boxes which, for obvious reasons, might put a lot of people off. Luckily enough, though, so far they haven't implemented any kind of microtransaction bullshit with said blind boxes. And at first, I will fully admit, I didn't really love how much cars cost compared to how many coins you won from races, but that got corrected over time, and with this current season as of recording, if you do some challenges every so often, you've got more than enough coins to buy the cars that you want and go absolutely nuts with blind boxes. 
But if you stick solely with career mode, the payout for races compared to the price of, quote, featured cars and blind boxes, it's not exactly right. But here's the thing. It's still a solid, solid racing game. What so easily could have just been a throwaway licensed game that came and went, and honestly, maybe kind of did to be honest considering so many people slept on this game, I think is genuinely incredible. I can say with the utmost confidence that I think this is probably the best arcade racer in at least the last five years. Honestly, maybe even the last decade. It is near perfection. Honestly, I have had so much fun with this incredible racing game. When I don't know what else to play, this is the game that I fall back upon. I absolutely, unequivocally adore a Hot Wheels game. Number one inscription. Oh my god, this game, this game, this game, this Oh, this game. Oh, this game, this game, this game. I have never experienced a game like this before. And honestly, I don't want to experience a game like this again because this game has taken over my life. I see inscription in my sleep. And I bet creator Daniel Mullins loves that. The last game that I became this obsessed over that I genuinely kept notes for like in a notebook ass notebook was Breath of the Wild. And before that, it was Fez. This bizarre, fascinating SCP foundation ass game is it's making me keep notes. And for that, I love it and I hate it and I love it. In a year of seemingly every single game being a deck builder or having deck building in it, Inscription shouldn't work as well as it does. But what makes it so, so, so much more is the unsettling, bizarre, fascinating mind fuckery of it all. Inscription isn't just steeped in the mysterious and the macabre, it bathes in it. It just simply is. It feels like this game is somehow alive. Like it's peering at you from your desktop, just being all weird and creepy and ominous. And it achieves this creepy, weird, engrossing tone with such incredible confidence and devotion to its world building and its whole vibe. With lowercase letters that are spaced out and everything. And Inscription gets really weird and meta and unsettling and there's constantly, constantly hints at the game being so much more than just a deck builder. With the game runner and the artifice of it all that is so cleverly explored, and there's cards that are literally talking to you and they might be alive, and there might be death and resurrection, and there's cryptic messages and sacrifices and all other types of bonkers shit. And the thing is, I haven't even seen the crazy shit apparently, but I'm fucking obsessed with it. This game gets in your goddamned head because every single time that you think you have it figured out, something new happens. And it makes you pause and you just go, wait a minute, what, 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 what just happened? What was that? And the game makes no explicit mention of it. There's no flashing lights or a winking nod saying, that was really weird, wasn't it? No, it just is. Because the game world is so wholly realized and you're just there trapped, trying to make sense of it all. And honestly, I didn't even become obsessed with this game because of the strange, fascinating stuff on the periphery, gazing at you with beady, weird little eyes and crying out for help and crying out for you to dig deeper and deeper and deeper until you're on subreddits at like 3 a.m. and you haven't slept for four days. I became obsessed at first with Inscription because at its black, black heart, this game is also a really solid card game. So this is how it goes. You have rows of four cards, and your main goal is to defeat the other player's cards so that you can then attack them directly. As you play, you're sacrificing cards to be able to play stronger cards, and there's all kinds of interesting, unique abilities and combinations for cards, and there's weird, cool power-ups, and honestly, building up your deck and getting better at the game, that's a huge draw in and of itself. 
It's one of those games that after a few turns, it's simple enough to pick up on quickly, but complex and deep enough that you can spend hours upon hours learning more and getting better at it. The card game alone is good enough that if you simply focused on that aspect of the game, without ever even bothering it with the bonker shit, Inscription would still be one of the games of the year. But then you pile on all of the fucking incredible bonkers narrative and the world surrounding the game, and you just want to keep playing this run-based game over and over and over and over again, not only because it's genuinely a blast to play, but because you have to keep playing it. You have to see what bonker shit is going to happen next. I haven't played something like Inscription, honestly, maybe ever. And it's been a long time since I've had a game that I've been so eager to play again and again and again every single time I put it down. In fact, I even have the game open right now as I narrate this video. Seriously, I love, love, love Inscription. This game makes no sense. It terrifies me. I'm obsessed with it, and it is easily my game of the year in a year of incredible games. Well, there you have it, my friends. The games of the year for 2021. Thank you so, so much for watching. You are pretty amazing. And honestly, this year, at least for video games, <laughs> at least for video games, it was pretty amazing, too. So please like, comment, subscribe, all of that stuff, um, especially on this video, as I'm sure you have a whole bunch of opinions about how stupid I am and how wrong I was. And that'd be great. Um, I put a lot of time and effort into this, and it was a lot of fun to do. So, yeah, it would mean the absolute world if you could like, comment, subscribe, all that wonderful stuff. Thank you so, so much for watching. Don't forget that, um... You're pretty awesome. You're pretty dope. And uh, I'll hopefully see you in 2022. Have a wonderful new year. Don't forget that you are loved. You're amazing. And until next time, smooches to you. Bye.